Carpa ship set sail for Tema. Afram Plains farmers sent SOS for the reintroduction of Operation Cowlick to deal with Fulani headsmen. And WHO declares Sierra Leone free of Ebola. Good evening, just gone by the headlines. You're welcome to the studios of GBC 24 and GTV. This is when we update you on events around our world. I'm Akushika Akwe. And I'm Conrad Kakrava. The Minister for Power, Dr. Kwabna Donko, says the process of taking the power ship through immigration and customs procedures in Turkey after a set sail from the port of Tuzla were all considered when the timeline for the arrival of the first power ship in Ghana was announced. At a ceremony in Turkey to see the ship set sail to Ghana, the CEO of car power ship Orhan Remzi Karandiniz, the Turkish Minister of Energy and Ghana's Minister of Power, Dr. Kwabna Donko, were all emphatic that the ship would arrive in Ghana three weeks after it set sail from the port in Tuzla, Istanbul. The ship already has set off from the immigration point in Turkey. The floating power station named Aisegul Sultan after the sister of the chairman of Karadine's holding will add 225 megawatts of power to the national grid. Car Powership Ghana Company Limited, a subsidiary of Karadine's holding in June 2014, signed a 10-year power purchase agreement with the electricity company of Ghana. Under the deal, the company is expected to build two electricity generating vessels to produce over 450 megawatts of power, which is expected to contribute about 22% of the country's electricity needs for 10 years. The 450 megawatts electricity supply will help to resolve the perennial power cuts in Ghana while providing a substantial cost advantage as the country's cheapest thermal energy resource. At a ceremony to bid farewell to the power ship and in the full glare of international reporters, the CEO of Cardinez Holding, Orhan Remzi Cardinez, said he was happy that the company was contributing to the development of other countries. The Minister of Power, Dr. Kabna Donko, was excited that the ship had finally set sail to Ghana. Ghana is eagerly awaiting the arrival of this vessel in our waters. We have gone through a temporary period of power challenges. But as we speak, we are almost at the end of it. Indeed, as at yesterday, another generating asset had landed on our coast. And once we have this power badge and two other projects ongoing, we can safely say we'll be generating enough power to meet our power needs. The minister took a tour of the power ship before it sailed off. The power ship then set sail at exactly 12.20 hours Turkish time. The Karadenez power ship, this one known as the Aisogo Sultan, has just taken off on its way to Ghana. Officials here say it will take about 21 days instead of the uh, usual 30 days to arrive in Ghana. And this is because this power ship is being powered by an, an extra power boot that will make it arrive ahead of time. Considering the urgency of the situation, the CEO of Karadenez Holding, Orhan Remzi Karadenez, told GBC24 that a fast boat called a semi-submersible vessel has been contracted to pull the badge for it to arrive in Ghana earlier than expected. Again, we understand that it takes 30 days to sail to Ghana, but for now we know it's going to take about 15 days. Uh, what was the new arrangement? Uh, there's a semi-submersible vessel, a special purpose vehicle that will uh, pick up the vessel from Istanbul, will submerge, will float the barge on top of it, will float again and then will uh, go at a much higher speed so that we are able to reduce uh, a couple of weeks of the voyage time. The chief executive of Great Co, Mr. William Amuna, says it would take about a week to connect it to the national grid when it arrives in the country. When the ship arrives, we would have to hook up from the gantry 
at the top there, the structure you see up there, would have to hook that to the first tower that is in the sea. We are expecting that within one week we would have finished all the works that would link up to the power system and our control center. Other officials from the ECG were happy that finally the ship had set sail to Ghana. We are very happy that the ship is finally uh, leaving for Ghana. It has been a long winding road, but at the end of the day, we've gotten to the expected end. And the expected end is that this ship is going to Ghana to support electricity generation and distribution. Officials are optimistic that the arrival of the ship will help the country in the fight against what has become known as Dumso Dumso. However, there were some media reports that Ghanaians had been lied to because the ship was still in Turkey. It's a process and we made sure we said look it was going to go into quarantine for customs and all other um, checks to be done and all within the three week period. So it is not when it set sail, it at least set sail from the dockyard to customs for quarantine. Meanwhile, According to car power ship officials, the vessel bringing in the power ship, the Black Marlin, has set off from the immigration checkpoint in Turkey. Abdulhai Mumin, GPC 24, Istanbul, Turkey. Farmers in their front plains in the eastern region are appealing to the government to, as a matter of urgency, reintroduce Operation Cowleg to bring an end to the continuous deadly attacks launched on them by Fulani herdsmen. Most farmers in the Afran Plains have moved from their villages to nearby big towns. In the process, large quantities of food from farmlands in the area, considered Ghana's food basket, go waste. The Afran Plains of Ghana for a very long time has remained a strategic food source in the country's quest towards food security. The fertile nature of the land makes it favorable for the cultivation of vegetables, cassava, yam, planting, and other food stuff. With river from traversing the plains, over thousands of farmers and their families are able to farm all year round using rudimentary irrigation. The savanna nature of the vegetation over the years has also attracted migrant Fulani cattle headsmen from neighboring Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger in search of grass and water for their livestock. But of late, competition for grazing land as against rising demand for more farmland has led to deadly confrontations between the farmers and the nomad Fulanis. To put an end to the resultant deadly attacks, the government deployed personnel from the Ghana Armed Forces to the plains to contain their occurrence. The exercise was christened Operation Cowleg. The Operation Cowleg team really saved us. Today, Operation Cowleg has ended, but the clashes have not stopped. This village is Jobiase, one of the communities under the Kwao East District. Since the beginning of 2015, over 10 people have been killed, with countless others sustaining gunshot wounds as a result of the Fulani aggression. Some farmers, for fear of their lives, have migrated to nearby big towns with a few left behind under constant fear. Members from some of the affected communities took the team to some abandoned farms. We used to harvest all sorts of vegetables, but now if we come here, the Fulanese will kill us. I planted three acres of cassava, but the cattle have destroyed all. We only visit our farms when we know the headsmen and their cattle will not be there. I've been using this rubber to harvest rainwater for some time now, but whenever the Fulanis get here, they offer the water to their animals and destroy the rubber. 
They cut all like fresh grass, so they set fire into our farm within a short time. When the grass starts growing, they bring the cattle to graze on it. I just planted corn, but I am afraid the cattle will soon destroy it. These are some spent cartridges our team could found in the bush apparently fired from guns used by the Fulani headsmen. In the course of capturing this story, 32-year-old Kwame, a tomato farmer, reports to us that his farm was being destroyed by a head of cattle. When we got to the scene, we could not film the destruction at close-up range because the Fulani headman could have fired on us if we did. In the affected villages, some of the locals showed our team some gunshot wounds sustained from the Fulani attacks. This 67-year-old woman lost her 18-year-old son on Christmas Eve 2014. The late Amachi was the fetish priest of the village. <laughs> A buy or buy a pen of charm, no call. One of my children came crying that a younger brother has been killed by the Fulani. I cannot even recall how he was buried. To compound the plight of the farmers in their farm plains, health workers in some health facilities have also threatened to leave as they showed me pictures of how the hetman invaded their hospital a few weeks ago. To the helpless chiefs and their people, the only way out of this problem is for government to reintroduce Operation Kauleg to offer them protection. This area used to be a major food basket until the arrival of the Fulanis. I have received information that the Fulanis have planned to kill me and I am worried. As is the case now, the general feeling of the citizenry of the Afram Plains is that of total abandonment by the states to their fate. It is the hope of members of the affected communities that government will quickly intervene to bring life back to the affected communities. Reporting for GBC 24, Gifty AJ. So it's a year now since the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development initiated the National Sanitation Day exercise to awaken citizens on the need to keep surroundings clean at all times. Sector Minister Alhaji Collins Dauda on Saturday was at some communities in Greater Accra to observe the level of participation in the national exercise. The National Sanitation Day exercise began as a regional tour last November with a final exercise held in Bonahafu. Though it has ended, the monthly exercise is still on, with the MMDAs expected to spearhead the clean up in their various districts. Local Government Minister Al Haj Collins Dauda and his entourage toured parts of Tema to see the response of residents. He first stopped at Bechile in the Kpung, Katamansu district. The Wechile Manche reminded the people that keeping the environment clean is a collective responsibility. The team also was at Tema East, where various groups, including the Tema Manche, Ni Ajay Kraku II, helped clean up the lorry station, which had heaps of refuse. Alhaji Collins. We do apologize for that. We will try to bring you this story before the end of the news. Writers from across Africa have met at the Accra International Conference Center to mark International Writers' Day. This year's conference was dedicated to the late giant of African literature, Chinua Achebe. Writers portray the realities in the society. 
reflecting the different shades of life, the echo, the hopes and dreams, successes and failures, the disappointments and aspirations of people. Africa has a number of writers whose works are recognized on the international scene. This year's conference of the Pan-African Writers Association was in honor of one of Africa's prolific writers, the late Chinua Achebe. The late Chinua Achebe was credited for charting a path of modern African literature through his books, which touched on various issues the modern African person is confronted with. The international conference in Accra brought together writers, scholars, creative artists, students and other admirers of literature to reflect on the works of Chinua Achebe and how they set the tone for articulating the African dream. Dr. Ikechuku Achebe, the son of the late Chinua Achebe, was grateful to the world for its memorial to Achebe. The ambassador of the Republic of Congo to France, Henri Lopez, himself a writer and an avid reader of Achebe, said the late giant of African literature was representative of a writer with true African heritage who made great strides on the world stage. The most known all over the world is things fall apart. Myself, I belong to a country which is Francophone, the, the Congo Brazzaville. In spite of that, for many years, this novel, Things Fall Apart, is in the curriculum of secondary school and many universities. Though the man Chinua Achebe is gone, the writers believe his works will continue to live on. The Bonohaf Regional Peace Council has organized an essay writing and presentation competition to test the knowledge of senior high school students on the need for peaceful coexistence in national development. The participants were to examine the four major conflict areas in the region, namely chieftaincy, religion, politics and land and natural resources, factoring in the courses effects with workable solutions to such conflicts. The Regional Peace Council and partners identified the four major threats to peace in the region. As part of the plans to address these threats, the stakeholders resolved to target the youth, specifically those in second cycle institutions, to educate them on the need for peace rather than violence at all times. The chairman of the Bonahaf Regional Peace Council, Reverend Father William Treme, said, this competition was consequently designed to test the students' understanding of peace and security, the causes and effects of conflict in society, and how to handle tense situations. In all, 10 students from five schools took part in the competition, with two representing each school. In the presentation and submission of the articles, one student from each school had the opportunity to make a 25-minute presentation on their chosen topics in relation to threats to peace in the Bonahafa region. Notre Dame Girls SHS took the first two positions, with Martina Jemayabwa emerging the winner, while Rose Mirabowini came second. Ms. Benedicta Tutua of Chinyaman for SHS rounded up the top three positions. For their contributions to the competition, some of the participants from Sunyai, Odumasi and St. James Senior High Schools had consolation prizes. The Regional Peace Council says peace clubs are to be formed in senior high schools to spread the message of peace, while members become peace ambassadors. Presents at the events were dignitaries like the Omahima of Sunyani Traditional Area, Nana Yanyama, and the Regional Boards of the Youth Employment Service, Nana Warai. 67 participants have graduated from the GBC Television Training School after going through four months of intensive training in television production. On completion of the course, the participants were urged to be good ambassadors of the school by making good use of the knowledge acquired and generate creative ideas wherever they find themselves. After being trained in a general course in television production techniques, participants were encouraged to build upon the knowledge they have acquired in camera handling, film editing and directing. Addressing the participants and guests at the closing ceremony, the Director of Technical Production of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, Mr. Oscar Incho said, the participants should be able to come out with creative ideas which conform with the country's tradition and culture and project that to the rest of Africa and the world at large. 
now that we are going digital and uh, we are having multiple channels and we are also attempting to introduce a lot more of local content, it means that we need a lot of people like you. So I want to encourage you to continue to uh, build on what you have acquired because um, you have shown traits of real good traits that can be used to satisfy the quest for good local content. Short movies and television talk shows the participants handled by themselves during the training were shown. We've seen people make billions of dollars just from being on, the, on, on social networks. Are there any advantages of social media? You can advertise your product on social media for free. Some participants told the news team they have benefited a lot. It was an opportunity given to me to come here and then show whatever I, I have dreamt to be. As I came here, I was just out of touch. And uh, I don't know whatever it was. Uh, I mean, it was just like a dream to me. But for now, I can say that I know how to edit. I can do graphics. When you come and you enroll, you realize that you've, you've had a good training and you go out there to, to show the world what you have. The participants also said they are poised to give out their best. The Ashanti Regional Police Command has arrested some suspected criminals who have been on the police wanted list. One such suspect is 32-year-old Manam, who is believed to have played a key role in several violent crimes in the Ashanti region. The police command is also happy to have arrested another man affectionately called Babangida, who is suspected of being a main financier of some of the hardened criminals in the region. Another man said to be the supplier of arms to the criminals is also in the grips of the police. The deputy Ashanti Regional Police Commander ACP Ampofoduku made this known to the media at a news briefing in Kumasi. The Ashanti Regional Police Command has been on a war path in the fight against the committing of violent crimes in the region. As part of the strategy, the police have undertaken a number of soups in the Kumasi metropolis. These activities follow tip-offs and intelligence gathering. In the course of this crusade, hardened and notorious criminals who have been operating in the region have been arrested. Some of them are remand prisoners. These include one Faisal Lebelebe, now serving a 100-year jail term with hard labor, Awal jailed for 45 years, and Bernice, who is also serving a 45-year term in prison. One of such criminals, Maya, died during a shootout with the police in 2007. One key suspect, known affectionately as Babangida, has eluded the police for some time now. Babangida is suspected to be the key financier of some of the criminals in the Ashanti region. His eventual arrest followed the arrest of the notorious Mohamed Abubakar, popularly called Manam, and his accomplice, Abdul Fatal Issa, aged 24, early this month. Manam is said to have led different gangs to undertake about three different robberies in Kumasi in just one night by seizing various taxis from their drivers and using them to carry out the operations. According to the deputy police commander, it was Manam and his suspected accomplice Abdul Fatal Issa who led the police to apprehend the other suspects following their arrest early this month. ACP Ampofoduku spoke also about the deeds of the arrested convicts and why their arrest is a breakthrough for the police in their crusade against the committing of crimes in the Ashanti region. From the beginning of this month, we have stepped up our activities and we will not rest until after Christmas so that residents in Kumase will also have a very peaceful Christmas. We'll be back with business.
In business news, Unilever Ghana Limited, manufacturers of Lux Beauty Bar Soap, has launched five new soaps made from delicate floral notes and moisturizing silk accents. The company says the new addition is made from fine fragrance skin treats by world best perfumes and other rich ingredients carefully selected to nourish the skin. Since 1925, Lux has continued to bring the best of beauty and the pleasure that comes with it to every woman in the world. Brand owners say they are committed to creating indulgent skin treats women crave for to provide an exceptional experience in and out of the shower. Unilever says its products are infused with fine fragrances crafted by the world's best perfume experts. It is also designed to exceed consumer expectations. The launched products have five different fragrances. The soft touch, made from rose petals, bergamot and blueberry, ideal for all skin types, lax soft caress made of tuberose, lily of the valley and jasmine, which give the skin a natural softness. A combination of almond oil and jasmine make up velvet touch, which helps one step out of a bath with smooth skin. Lux Shake Me Up is infused with refreshing mint and chilled cucumber, while Lux Wake Me Up comes with a tingling fragrance, cool mint, which restores the skin and brings back its natural radiance. According to the brand building director, Clarence Nati, Lux has operated in Ghana for the past 19 years and is in more than 100 countries worldwide. He said the moisturizing factor of the product makes one feel very special. Now, what we've done differently this time is um, we have, on one hand, maintained the excellent moisturization benefits that people have come to expect from Lux but also significantly improve the fragrance credentials of the brand. And how have we done this? We have, we have done so by working with some of the leading perfumers in the world to create very distinct and very noticeable uh, fragrances across all the five variants we have. Unilever says Lux is not just a soap that smells good. Brand owners are sure that they have invested in world-class fragrance to re-establish its much-loved heritage of long-lasting fragrance and this helps women to ignite their spark. They add that Lux believes that beauty doesn't have to be about hard work but rather about pleasure. A resident radiologist of the Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital in Kumasi, Dr. Mansa Amanmu, is the ultimate winner of the Maiden GTP or GA consumer promotion. She therefore becomes the new brand ambassador for Ghana's original, genuine and authentic wax print. Her winning package includes a fully paid trip for two to Dubai and $500 in spending money. For years... The GTP brand has maintained its position as Ghana's most authentic and foremost choice of wax print. It is represented with four labels, the GTP Nustal, GTP Adipa, GTP Safwa and GTP Insuma. In recent times, Ghana's marketplace has seen an influx in cheap and counterfeit wax prints from different countries, making it difficult for GTP consumers to distinguish between the fake and original. As a way out, the company introduced the GTP Oga consumer promotion to make their loyal customers able to verify the authenticity of any GTP products they buy. Upon buying the wax print, one is expected to scratch the silver panel text the code to 1393 to verify its genuineness. This promotion ran for the entire third quarter of the year with over 5,000 people participating. Winners for each month received smartphones and airtime among others. 20 out of the 1,500 monthly winners were shortlisted for the ultimate prize where the young radiologist emerged the overall winner. In this promotion, we offered Ghanaians, or we promised Ghanaians, thousands of prizes. Indeed, we had 4,500 prizes to give away. And thousands of people won in the months of July, August, and September. And we are pleased about that. Understandably, Dr. Mansa Amamu was grateful to GTP and said the prize package is timely 
GTP is offering her the best wedding present as she heads to the altar on November 21st. It's like a fairy tale come true. I want to say a very big thank you to God, to GTP, for providing us with original, durable, quality fabric that cuts across all the ages. And thank you so much for this prize. Honestly, I never really dreamt this this would be mine to I wouldn't be, I didn't never dreamt I would be standing here today receiving this prize but I just want to say thank you the head of Vlisco Mr Kofi Boating pledged that the GTP brand will continue to deliver on its promise of quality and value for money we have an unwritten contract with Ghanaians to give them the best of african prints to clothe themselves majority of our consumers are women so i'm really happy that it's a woman that came up tops, and we congratulate, that, um, we congratulate the winner. We believe this will help her, or this will urge other women, especially those who have been um, patronizing other fake products, to also join the bad wagon to promote made in Ghana goods. Management says the GTP or GA consumers' promotion has come to stay and urged the public to participate in all upcoming events. Rice farmers at Ligba in the Sabalugu municipality of the northern region have been taken through fertilizer application, weed control, rice varieties suitable for production among others. The capacity building is an initiative of SNV, a Netherlands development organization. The local rice can feed West Africa project facilitates business interaction between farmers and marketers of rice and other value chain actors. It is to meet suitable rice needs of consumers. Ghanaian farmers and rice processors are competing with other farmers worldwide, and it is therefore necessary for farmers and processors of local rice to respond to the changing needs of consumers by offering them quality, tasty, aromatic, and stone-free rice to keep pace with their competitors. It is against this background that SNV introduced the capacity building to help promote the production of consumer preferred varieties, quality processing, and consumption of local rice. Africa, and for that matter, West Africa, is blessed with arable land, and we have the potential to produce and feed ourselves. Speaking at the 2015 Farmers' Field Day celebration at Legba in Northern Region, the project manager of the local Rice Can Feed West Africa project, SNV Ghana, Mr. Zakaria Jalil, said they have established 15 demonstration plots to transfer improved technology into rice production in the area. It is therefore necessary for farmers and processors of local rice to respond to the changing needs of consumers by offering them quality, tasty, aromatic and so free rice comparable or even better quality than our competitors when they import. The project coordinator of the Northern Development Society, Nordeso, Mansu Jacob, said as partners of the SNV Rice Project, Nordeso has been instrumental in the provision of extension services on and off demonstration fields and farmers' fields. The officials taught the demonstration fields to assess the state of the project. We'll be back with my journey. Good evening and welcome to this segment. My name is Ifia Chema Uzu. Today, GBC24 is taking you to visit a family of monkeys, a home Agata, Abrewa, and Blacky. These are members of a large monkey family in the Dresdenai Monkey Sanctuary in the Bunahafu region. This natural home is a treasure of the town and one of the oldest in Ghana. Measuring about 40 acres, the sanctuary is home to about 1,000 monkeys, but records less than 10 tourists in a day. With our camera and a bunch of bananas as bait, we set out on a journey we call a day in the monkey sanctuary. We were curious to find out whether or not the century had gone extinct. After weeks of research and planning, GBC 24 set foot in one of Ghana's oldest monkey habitats in the Bunahafu region, the Diesidai Monkey Sanctuary. 
Research has it that this tourist attraction has struggled over the years to keep functioning due to the little attention given it. So this journey was to see for ourselves how the sanctuary was faring. It was about 6 a.m. and the news team was already en route to Diazidine. After about nine hours on the road, we finally arrived at Domahinko. Taxis are the only public transports in this part of the town. Our journey to the sanctuary was about 15 kilometers on a dusty road. Diazida is not your ideal community. It lacks all the basic social amenities necessary for a normal life. And their only pride is the monkey sanctuary, which is located on the outskirts of the town. On arrival, GPC 24 noticed there were no signposts or indications of the exact area of the monkey sanctuary. After some inquiries, we met these residents. Bob and Kuma are the tall guards here. They double as tomato and pepper farmers, respectively. After a short briefing on the forest and what to expect, we started our tour on what I call a day in the monkey sanctuary. This tree was used as a sponge in the olden days. For most part of their day, the monkeys hide in the bamboo bushes until there is an intrusion. The Dwezidai monkeys are mostly Mona monkeys. In Akan, they are known as Mokuya. The monkeys are protected and treated as humans and thus the people relate to them as they would to any member of the community. I sought to find out from Kuma how the sanctuary came about. Nanasum got lost in a forest and found shelter in a broken tree. He later discovered the monkeys at the same place. Oh, sorry. Hey, do you have a nice dance? Do you have a nice dance? No, I don't want to know. No, I don't want to know. Papa, I don't want to know. Although they are different in sizes, the monkeys are identical in nature. To differentiate the very older ones from the younger ones, Kuma and Bob have come up with some interesting names for them. We have Agatha and Ahofe. I gave them names to make them friendly. This is Blackie, the oldest of all the monkeys. He is a bully, but just like the others, quite friendly and harmless. The monkeys eat corn, bananas, plants and grains. Just like humans, they use their fingers to peel the fruits before they eat. According to Bob, there is no record of the exact number of monkeys in the sanctuary, but says a census was conducted years ago by some foreigners and students. Also, there has been no record of death of any of this troop except one that was shot and killed by an unknown person some years ago. Today, there is a ban in place, making it a taboo to hunt in the monkey sanctuary. Unlike the Boabin Fiema monkey sanctuary in the Bunahafu region, and the Tafiatome monkey habitat in the Volta region, the Dwezida monkey sanctuary is poorly patronized. Kuma says this is because the tourist site is not properly developed. We would be very pleased if the government can help develop this sanctuary. It was clear, however, that in the midst of all these challenges, the people of Dwezida are determined to maintain their pride, the tourist site, in their own small way. Nevertheless, they still hope that the government will help develop this national asset to bring in some revenue. They add that this is one of the few monkey sanctuaries in the country that can do a lot when given the necessary attention. Ghana 
Kakuma is blessed with at least one tourist site in all 10 regions. Unfortunately, almost all of them are not in top shape to bring in the much needed revenue. For the people in the communities that have the tourist attractions, their wish is for some support, whether from the government or private partnership to properly develop these sites, market them, and draw enough visitors all year round. This has been another journey. Join us next week and thank you for watching. Let's take our earlier story now. It's a year now since the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development initiated the National Sanitation Day exercise to awaken citizens on the need to keep surroundings clean at all times. Sector Minister Alhaji Collins Tauda on Saturday was at some communities in Greater Accra to observe the level of participation in the national exercise. The National Sanitation Day exercise began as a regional tour last November with a final exercise held in Bonahafu. Though it has ended, the monthly exercise is still on, with the MMDAs expected to spearhead the clean up in their various districts. Local Government Minister Al Haji Collins Dauda and his entourage toured parts of Tema to see the response of residents. He first stopped at Bechile in the Kpung Katamansu district. The Wechile Manche reminded the people that keeping the environment clean is a collective responsibility. The team also was at Tema East, where various groups, including the Tema Manche, Ni Ajay Kraku II, helped clean up the lorry station, which had heaves of refuse. Alhaji Collins Tauda and the Greater Accra Regional Minister Ni Lai Afutiagbo commended the people for their enthusiasm and pledged support to provide them with the needed logistics. At Zingi Shore, a fishing community also at Tema East, sanitation was not the best while the roads were unmotorable. Alhaji Collins Dawuda congratulated the people for helping to clean their surroundings. He said even though the original tour has ended, he expressed the regional coordinating councils and the committees to make the day statutory. At Asesewa in the Eastern region, the exercise began as early as half past five in the morning. The regional minister, Mr. Enchibu Isiaku Setra, in the company of the district chief executive of Upper Manyakropo, Mr. Joseph Teteangbo, and the MP, Mr. Jeff Kevianu, joined residents clean the surroundings. They filled some potholes on the town roads and at the lorry park. The district assembly used the occasion to present a motorbike to the district office of NCCE to facilitate their outreach programs. The regional minister, Mr. Enchibu Isiaku Setra, handed over the key to the district office of NCCE, Mr. Daniel Amwako, while a microfinance, Yellow Stars, also presented wheelbarrows and cash of 1,000 CDs to support the regional sanitation exercise. In other news, Sierra Leone has officially been declared free of Ebola by the World Health Organization. Thousands of people took to the streets of the capital, Freetown, at the stroke of midnight, marking 42 days without a single declared case of the disease. There were further cheers when the WHO local representative made the official announcement later on Saturday. The outbreak killed almost 4,000 people in Sierra Leone over the past 18 months. Many gathered around a giant cotton tree in the center of the city. Some lit candles in memory of the victims, while others danced with joy. A country is considered free of human-to-human -human transmission once two 21-day incubation periods have passed since the last known case tested negative for a second time. Persons with disabilities in sports in Ghana have been supported with assorted sports kits to enable them to train professionally to make a mark in their fields. On July 28, 2015, a survey published on the BBC suggested that the world's worst place to be disabled was in Ghana. In a bit to correct this, Farm for Life Foundation and Change Foundation have joined forces to present items to persons with disabilities and the school of the blind. The various sporting disciplines that received equipment included the Ghana Cricket Association, Ghana Rugby Football Union and the Ghana Handball Association. The equipment included jerseys, sewing machines, cricket bats, helmets, elbow guards and wicket keeping pad. Members of the Farm for Life Foundation and Change Foundation say they are happy to give their widows mites. It hurts me when I come to Ghana, as everything is talking about money. 
We have no money. None of us are rich. It's not what money you got. Please don't, don't look at money as the answer. It is not the answer. It's what's in your heart is the answer. And because we have compassion for what we do and passion, that's why we're here. Because we care for our fellow human being. And that's whether he's black or white. There is no difference. Our wish is to come back here um, after helping you to, to, with your coaching to bring a team over to, the, to Ghana to play against the first Ghana blind cricket team. And we hope that one day, we hope that one day you will join us in a World Cup too. The chairman of the United African Organization, Dr. Ogzi Kwame Nkuma, praised the para-athletes for winning medals at the just-ended All-Africa Games. I must congratulate them for getting three medals in the recent tournament in Congo. The Deputy Director General of the National Sports Authority, Mr. Saka Akwe, applauded the timely gesture. I want to urge our brothers and sisters to make sure that they put the equipment to good use mm -hmm. so that when Farm for Life sees that they are being used well, definitely more will come. The athletes hope to do better with their new kids. In addition of the rebranded live drama series, Camps of Tomorrow, Sunday, 8th November, at the National Theatre, we bring you a recap of the previous performance. It was a play by the Bonkasa group depicting the saying, a true friend sticks closer than a brother. <laughs> The play tells the story of a poor family in a settlement called Pomkasa. Due to the hardship, the eldest son of the family, Buafo, decided to travel to the city in search of greener pastures to help cater for his family back home. In the middle of his journey, Buafo found himself in a forest, very tired and weak. A hunter from a nearby village helped him and took him to his village called Bonisuma, where Buafo worked with the hunter. One day, the princess of the village went to the forest to search for flowers. Buafu mistakenly took her for an animal and shot her dead. <laughs> but how will the people of the village receive this news, especially Kose? one of the village boys who says the princess is his heart's desire. <laughs> but the tradition in the village is that anyone who kills must also be killed. So this means Wafu would have to be killed as well. On the day he was to be killed, he pleaded with the Queen Mother to spur him so that he could go back to his village to inform his parents about the development after which he would return for his execution, but his request was turned down. His landlord, the hunter, pleaded that Boafo's request be granted and he stood as surety for him. When he returned for his execution, the Queen Mother was shocked and decided to spare his life. With technical support from the Ghana Meteorological Agency. Good evening, it's a pleasure to have you on the weather report segment of the evening news. Severe rainfall affected the capital and most parts of the south over the past 24 hours. As such, our deepest condolences are extended to those that incurred losses in one way or the other. But over the next 24 hours, let's see the significant changes are otherwise that are likely to affect us with regards to the weather. For tomorrow morning, few clouds would form over northern Ghana with some partly cloudiness over the rest of the country. A dry and hazy weather is expected over the north with some isolated thunderstorms possibly affecting the middle belt. 
Temperature wise, a minimum of 23 degrees Celsius would affect both the northern and the coastal regions, with temperature maintaining at 24 degrees Celsius over the middle belt. For tomorrow afternoon, a partly cloudy atmosphere is expected over the forest areas with some cloudiness over the coastal belt. Some isolated thunderstorms are likely to affect areas in the forest zone, with some isolated scattered rain showers likely to affect the coastal regions. Temperature-wise, a maximum of 37 degrees Celsius would affect the north, 32 over the middle, and 29 degrees Celsius for the coastal areas. And finally, for humidity, is likely to be low over the northern, normal over the middle, and high across the rest of the country over the next 24 hours. Over the next 48 hours, we expect cases of isolated thunderstorms to continue affecting the forest belt. But here is the weather in detail. Stay tuned. Keep watching the Winkle Weather Report and have an amazing evening. Good night. And we thank you for keeping company with us. Have a pleasant evening. Good evening.